name is uh, Mordechai Greenberg, and I am with Canada-Palestine Support Network, which is the co-sponsor of this meeting, along with the Solidarity for Palestinian Human Rights, SPHR chapter at uh, UBC. And this is part of uh, the uh, Israeli Apartheid Week, which is being held in campuses across Canada and in several other countries. As an introduction, I only want to make uh, one comment. I think we are at a cusp, a turning point, in the Palestine Solidarity Movement. For all the horrors inflicted on the people of Gaza in January, December and January by the Israeli military, the corresponding event which is really remarkable is the mushrooming explosion around the world of support for Palestinians as I would say in my awareness as never before. Today I was on the internet and there was a demonstration of thousands of people in Malmo, Sweden. And Malmo was hosting the uh, uh, um, tennis match between Israel and Sweden. And the organizers of the match, which was being held in a large stadium, decided as a result of the anger and protest of the Swedish people in the streets, that they would restrict entrance to this large stadium to a select group of 300 people. And the Israeli uh, tennis uh, star, was absolutely appalled. He said it's like when playing a practice match. It had lost all its glitter and importance. That's a, that's a small example of uh, the kind of anger that has arisen at Israeli atrocities. And I think the responsibility for us is now to organize with this change of popular awareness an effective and sustained campaign of boycott, divestment, and sanctions which can bring about real fundamental change. The opportunity is ours, the responsibility is ours, and let's wish all of us success in this endeavor. I'd now like to introduce Mohammed Balan, uh, from uh, Solidarity for Palestinian Human Rights at UBC. This week, we have been participating in International Israeli Apartheid Week, and this has caused a lot of controversy on campus due to the inconvenient truth that Israel is indeed an apartheid state. We drew chalk graffiti on the walls of a student union building and had, se and had several events throughout the week. In one of the anonymously issued pamphlets that attempted to discredit our efforts, it was stated that the charge that Israel is an apartheid state shamefully diminishes and exploits the just struggle against, self, against the injustices of South African apartheid. SBHR didn't have far to look in order to disprove this accusation or even attempt to show its absurdity, being that today we have the honor and the privilege to introduce one of the leaders who was at, who was at the forefront of the struggle against South African apartheid, a Jewish South African who I'm sure will do a better job than myself to explain exactly how South Africans feel about Israeli apartheid and whether or not it is an insult to, South African, to the South African struggle to identify Israeli policies as such. The highest serving Jewish South African in the democratic government of South Africa is the courageous Ronnie Castros. He brings to the floor a personal experience of intelligence and security acquired through the many years he served in the African National Congress, Congress's clandestine structure, structures. It was the Sharpeville Massacre of 1960 that inspired Castros to join the African National Congress that he eventually became a part of. Ronnie Castros has passionately espoused the cause of the Palestinian people for justice and national self-determination and believes this is the only way to secure peace and security for both Israeli and Palestinian peoples. 
He believes that as a South African of Jewish origin, he has a moral obligation to speak out against Israel's unacceptable policies and has founded a South African solidarity group called Not In My Name. And with no further delay, please join me in a warm round of applause for the extraordinary and inspirational Ronnie Castries. Good evening, everybody, and thanks so much to Mordecai and to Mohammed. It's very, very good to be here in Canada um, for all those many, many years. Uh, the people of Can Canada stood by us, supported us. It was extremely meaningful. From far off South Africa, whether one was in the prisons or whether one was in the underground, whether one was in exile, uh, we were very well aware of every single event of support that was taking place. And Mordechai's point today about uh, uh, Malmo and the tennis match there, you can imagine the impact that is making uh, in terms of the Palestinian people's struggle. And in fact, the impact it will make on Jews in Israel who are confused and who are not that aware as they should be that the government uh, is, is a government that like apartheid earned the revulsion of the international community and decent pe speaking people, decent thinking people everywhere. I've been rather amused coming here at uh, some of the propaganda utilized against the organizers of this Israel Apartheid Week um, from the extent of saying that this is a disservice to the people of South Africa and cheapens our struggle to uh, some of these other characters like your Minister of Immigration, Mr. Jason Kerry, and the principal of um, Toronto University, who seem to still be living, Mordecai, in a time warp in which any, any semblance of criticism of Israel is immediately equated with anti-Semitism, or any criticism of Zionism is equated with anti-Semitism. This is passé. This is part of the cusp now, the turning point that Mordechai has referred to, because for many, many years, post-1948, for the obvious reasons of sympathy with the Holocaust, but also um, the extent to which Israel and the Zionist lobby was able to manipulate public opinion and the media, but particularly because the Western powers, initially Britain as a key power, back to Balfour Declaration and Churchill's famous or infamous statement when he was saying that Britain wanted to bring about a, a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Uh, his statement uh, was, as you, I'm sure you know, well-read people here, um, that what is good for the Jewish people, meaning the Zionists, what is good for the Jewish people is good for the British Empire. Um, Brit uh, America inherited that mantle. And uh, I'm not going to go in here tonight because it's a subject of a lecture on its own. It's a subject of an of, of a entire uh, series of lectures, the role of Western capital, Western imperialism, and particularly the United States, in using Israel as a client functional state of American policy. And the Zionists do discredit to the Jewish people there and everywhere else by having lent themselves so assiduously to this project because of course they believe uh, a project of this kind, of the, the, the war on terror, etc., um, is going to give them the, uh, the, the extra time to survive and they'll play that to the hilt. But we also this week everywhere have been considering the comparisons between apartheid South Africa and apartheid Israel. 
And is this just a propaganda uh, exercise? Is this a way to help uh, the anti-Zionist, anti-Israeli forces to, to mobilize public opinion? Um, if that was the case, I, it, it, there's nothing wrong with it. But it's more than that. And I say there's nothing wrong with that, that because throughout history people were constantly making comparisons between one colonial power and another, one form of rule of repression and another, uh, fascist occupations in, in uh, Nazi Europe and so on. There's nothing wrong with that. And it, it's absolute poppycock to say that it denigrates and undermines the South African struggle if we say that the way Israel is behaving is just like uh, apartheid. Now, I'm going to play something of um, a quiz master here. I've got a question. I've got a quote. And I want to see if anybody here can get the uh, person's name who made this quote, because it's very relevant. It was made in 1960, so we're talking about nearly 50 years ago. And a South African said that Israel, like South Africa, is an apartheid state. C can you hear me? My voice carrying. Israel, like South Africa, is an apartheid state. It was made in November 1960. Does anybody here like to uh, suggest who might have made that statement? Favort. Favort. Yeah, but you've read all the stuff already and you've read my speech. <laughs> how, how, many, how many of you here would have thought, uh, in fact, I've been on a tour now in Britain, SOAS, School of Oriental African Studies, Oxford, I've come here to Ottawa, Montreal, Toronto, and uh, nobody was able uh, to, to indicate that it was the, um, the architect of apartheid, none other than Dr. Hendrik Favut, who had studied and got his degree in the early 30s in Germany, and a Germany uh, which was obviously before 1933 already being infected by the uh, race doctrines, and that was the university he had gone to. So Favut um, makes that statement all those years ago. He did indeed know what he was talking about. He might not be on our side, and I can assure you he wouldn't have been. So, in terms of, of what I was saying, certainly every single successor of the Wurz, uh, it was Balthazar Johannes Forster after him, uh, he was actually such a Nazi sympathizer that during the Second World War he was interred by Smuts's government in South Africa. And then after him was this infamous P.W. Boerta. Uh, they had the most uh, um, warm and close relations with Israel. Uh, and this development had taken place in a similar context to the way Israel finds it, its support internationally. Um, after the 1973 October War, when Egypt managed to regain the Suez Canal, South Africa rushed to Israel's assistance. Of course, America was, was the, the main supplier, but they needed anything that they could lay hands on, and especially small arms. There were big orders coming out of America. Um, so this then developed into the apartheid axis of Tel Aviv and indeed Pretoria and lasted until the late 80s with the demise of, of apartheid. But I just want to analyze a little bit for, for you here the similarities. What Dr. Favut, I'm actually putting myself in his mind, which isn't a difficult thing to do with people like that. Um, Israel, like South Africa, is an apartheid state, and he's never been to Israel. 
And one doesn't have to be there. You don't have to actually be in a particular country to form an opinion on the basis of its behavior and its doctrine and policies, do you? Um, so for him, it was the simplest, simplest comparison. And that was racial exclusivity, race purity. Just as Israel, for all the liberal um, facade and democratic facade, as everyone knows, Israel only gives citizenship to Jews and the right of return. Well, this was a wonderful thing for Favut because he was developing the policy of apartheid which only gave citizenship to white South Africans. And if you were of indigenous African origin, the black people, or mixed race, or people out of Asia, there's a big population, you did not have uh, the right of citizenship. Now, we needn't spend too much time pointing out what the right of citizenship means. But uh, clearly, in South Africa and in Israel, it meant that you didn't have the property rights, you didn't have the trading rights, you didn't have the right to live where you wished. You couldn't even in both cases join the military security structures which are so dominant in both those countries. <coughs> and which opened up the prospects of um, greater access to very special health services, even education, uh, and particularly the pension issue. I'm sure you're all aware of the nature of life for those Palestinians who live in Israel, the 20%, the so-called 1948 Palestinians. Um, they can't, they can't develop their property, their own homes. They can't even build up. What happens when um, their offspring need to get married? They, they, they have access to two percent of land in Israel for for uh, building. Um, the all important area of municipal services. And you will know this from the struggle of the Republicans in Northern Ireland or the Catholic population there, how they were discriminated against in terms of the superior um, access of Protestants to municipal services. Even in terms of the infamous marriage laws of South Africa, Israel too denies a person the right of marriage in their law if you want as a Jew or a Jewess to marry an Arab or vice versa. So one can go on and on with this list and there have been a huge number of, of works in this regard. Note as well our date, 1960. Israel, like South Africa, is an apartheid state. Um, this is before the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza in 1967. 